Well, warm and sincere welcome to each and every one of you, as I have said. And let's return back to our the portion of Scripture that we read in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 2. And uh, in essence, we are really focusing on verse 49. That is the foundation to what we will be looking at today. Luke chapter 2, verse 49 says this. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And as we begin this, uh, this uh, Christmas season, there will be a series of four sermons this day and next week, God willing, and uh, the two that follow, Christmas Day and the last Sunday of the year by God's grace. And we'll be looking at Christmas this time with a slight difference. Christmas in the words of Jesus. What did Jesus have to say about, in essence, Christmas, this time of year when we acknowledge his coming into the world? And I hope and pray by God's grace that we will be um, encouraged and, and built up in uh, following the words of our great Saviour. So let's just read a small portion here from verse 41 um, to verse 52 just to bring us back up to speed as it were. Uh, it says here, his parents, as Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so that it was after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously, and since we've been out of our minds. And he says to them, why did you see me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Well, many, many years ago, I remember some friends of mine attending a birthday party of someone they did not know. I couldn't get my head around that. Um, why would you go to the birthday party of someone who you have no relationship with? Later on when I saw them, they told me what a great time they had and so on. Now, I didn't go with them, obviously, because it didn't seem right. To me, they were enjoying the benefits without actually having a relationship with the person celebrating their birthday. And then I thought, when we consider what happens, when we consider um, this world, I thought to this, to a degree, isn't this what the people of the world do? Don't the people of the world enjoy the benefits of this world, the benefits of this creation without knowing the Lord? And they enjoy this world and the benefits of it without having a relationship with the Creator. Well, in, in John 1, it clearly tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and that the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Christmas is truly one of those times 
which highlights even more for me the disconnect, as it were, between sinners and a, a holy God. My friends, I tell you this morning, what God desires above all is for us to know Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What God desires is salvation for mankind, that all should be saved. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And what Scriptures is telling us is there is no one more important in the whole working out of this salvation than the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, this particular time of the year, at Christmas time, when virtually the whole world acknowledges His birth, we are to think on these things. We are to think on the angels appearing. We are to think on the shepherds watching their flocks at night. We are to think on the wise men following the star and Joseph and Mary finding no room at the inn. We think on those things, but we're to reflect, my friends, on what Christmas means from the very one whom Christmas is about, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it that Jesus says about the true meaning of Christmas? Now, if you know your Bibles, you will know that uh, uh, Luke and Matthew are the only two of the Gospels that contain, contain the birth narratives. Mark and John start their uh, uh, words, John obviously declaring the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is, but they start it from Christ's adult ministry. And what we can do, you see, we, we, we either get caught up with the, the first part, with the baby and the shepherds and the angels and Mary and Joseph uh, and the stars and the wise men and Herod and so on. Uh, and then we tend to jump to what John and, uh, and Mark say in terms of his adult ministry and him coming before John the Baptist and so on. And we can often forget about what Luke describes there in chapter 2 that we read that the Lord Jesus at the age of 12 years old was in the temple verse 46 now, it was, now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of teachers both listening to them and asking them questions and all who heard him were astonished at his answers and, and it was at the tender age of 12 that Jesus actually put down his marker concerning Christmas as we know it. Jesus at the tender age of 12 puts down the foundation of what Christmas means. 18 years, my friends, before he began his adult ministry, but sometimes this is overlooked. And Jesus here, you see, at a 12-year-old, states the foundational fact about his coming. He states what his coming into the world was all about. Look with me at verses 48 and 49. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So, so for today I want us to see Jesus says Christmas means that he must be about his father's business. Now it took Mary and Joseph, says verse 46, three days to find Jesus in the temple. They travelled a day and couldn't find him. So they had to travel back another day and then they spent another day looking around until they found him in the temple. And when they saw him they were amazed and said, why did you do this to us? Now of course Jesus' answer to them, I must be about doing my father's business, they didn't get it. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They didn't understand what Jesus was portraying. They didn't understand. And we're told that Mary 
pondered these things in her heart. That reminds me when, when the angel came to her and told her that she would be having a son uh, and the Most High would come upon her and she would conceive and bear a son, the Spirit of the Most High would come upon her and she would bear a son and they should call his name Jesus, Emmanuel. He shall save people from their sins. She pondered these things in her heart. Later, she would come to understand in Jesus' adult ministry what these words meant. She would hear Jesus speak. She would see Jesus do miracles. She would see her son on the cross and hear him speak to her and the disciple that was with her. Here is your mother. Here is your son. She would understand when she saw the empty tomb and saw him there. But for now, she kept these things in her heart. And then we are told uh, the obedient Jesus went home with his parents. Verse 30, 51. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. So he was saying Jesus was the perfect child. He was subject to them. He was obedient to them. He had laid the foundation. And now he was going home with his parents and was going to be obedient. He was going to be the carpenter. He was going to learn the trade of his father, as young men did. Mark 6 reminds us that's how people recognize him. Mark 6 verse 3 says, Is this not the carpenter's son? The son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And that's what he did. He was obedient and did not appear again on the scene until 18 years later. So the question I want us to ask uh, at this time is, what is his father's business? What is this, did not you know, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Well, his father's business, my friends, is salvation. Christmas, you see, means Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It's a gospel message, often stated, but a gospel message rarely heard. It is the most simple and profound declaration about Jesus being born. This is a faithful saying, the scriptures say, worthy of all acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And interestingly, the actual rendering of that verse is not to save sinners, but sinners to save. Christ Jesus came into the world, sinners to save. Now, we all know, don't we, that uh, we're not going to live forever. We all know, don't we, that also that life does not end with the grave. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 tells us that God has put eternity into every heart. Everybody knows. We may suppress that knowledge because in doing so it means we don't have to think about it. Uh, I've had the uh, sadness of having to go to many, many funerals. And, and nothing distresses my heart more uh, and causes me to, to lean on the Lord more than when uh, there is no evidence of God in the life of the one who has passed. You see, my friends, we suppress often. We can suppress the knowledge so we don't have to think about life after this one. We suppress the knowledge because therefore it means that we can, we can live for self. Or we can live for the here and now. <clears throat> but my friends, if that is us, today I plead with you that not believing does not change the truth. Refusing to acknowledge it does not change the scripture's sure and certain truthfulness. And the truth is this, Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost. In Mark chapter 1, at verse 14, we are told this, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent 
and believe the gospel and take him back to what we spoke at the beginning. There are all these people who are enjoying the benefits of this world. There are all the people around who are enjoying this earthly life. And we're being told here, look, it's temporary. It will not last. If, if you want an everlasting reward, there must be a relationship with the one who came into the world to save sinners. The only way to have that eternal relationship, says the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is to repent and believe the gospel. Because the most important thing about is not about this life. The most important thing for us is about the life to come. See, life's not about the physical. It's about the spiritual. And the world right now, more than ever, I think, is obsessed with the physical frame. It's obsessed with the things we can get. It's obsessed with the money we can amass. It's obsessed with the power we can have and so on. There are so many falsehoods, my friends, in the world trying to keep men and women from knowing the truth that Jesus brings. I know and have met those who are angry with the God they don't even acknowledge because of the death of a loved one or because of the desperate sickness of a loved one. And they place all the blame, as it were, at the feet of God who they don't recognize. My friends, regardless of our situation this morning, I tell you, God is not the cause of our woes. Sin is. In the beginning, says so Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and then indeed it was very good. In the beginning, my friends, there was no sickness. In the beginning, there was no death. We were not created to die. Adam and Eve were created to live. But Adam, the federal or head, the representative of the human race, he chose to sin. We're reminded of how he then tried to hide from God. Remember in our God our series when God comes and says, Why are you hiding? Adam knew he was guilty. And all of us, because we come from Adam, are considered guilty too, because he was our representative. He is the father of the human race, and because of that, Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5, verse 18, tells us, Just as one man's trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one man's righteousness acted it resulted in justification and life. Let's make no mistake, what Adam did it brought a whole of creation into condemnation and we're told the wages, the payment as it were for sin is death. But, but my friends, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again and again we see the Bible, in the Bible we see Jesus about his father's business. And for Jesus, it was a must. It wasn't a, I, I think I might. He says, I must. It was a must in, in the need of going to see the woman at the well. It was a must in terms of Nicodemus. It was a must in, in terms of Zacchaeus. It was a must, my friends. Every time he encountered, it was a must. And again, he must be about his father's business. And one of the great examples of, of, of how God, uh, Christ, did all these works, because what we have to remember is even through all the sickness and, and death, not everybody that was healed came to know him. They enjoyed the benefits of him, as it were, in this life, but did not know him to take them into the life that is to come. How many of the multitudes that he healed he that they came across him. He must need that man who, in the Gadarenes who was possessed of demons. He must meet. Such was Jesus. And one of the, the stories that actually reinforces uh, uh, this whole concept uh, of, of illness and sickness and so on and, and salvation was, was from Mark 2. Hey, if you remember the story of the paralyzed man being lowered through the roof in Mark 2. 
Yeah, they couldn't, they were trying to get around to try and get into where uh, Jesus was, was, um, was speaking. And, and there they, 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 they couldn't get in, so they went up onto the roof, we're told. There in Mark, and in chapter 2, they had to go up onto the roof and lower themselves, lower their friend, as it were, down into Jesus' presence. There was no longer room, says Mark 2, to receive them, not even near the door. And so the man bringing the paralytic, they, when they had broken through the roof, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus, we read, saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And then we see the scribes there muttering and murmuring, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he says, Why do you reason in your hearts about these things? He says, Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. Which is easier? Because Jesus has said, your sins are forgiven you. And we think about much in terms of uh, falsehood of today. And we see the, the, the precious nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you would ask this paralytic man, what's your greatest need? He would have said, my greatest need is, is to not be paralyzed. Just like we saw, uh, the, you know, God asks with the man at the pool of Bethesda. He says, do you want to be made well? He's been laying there for over 30 years trying to get into the water. Just like the, the madman in, in the tombs who was possessed of demons. You asked him, what is it you need more than anything else? They would have said their physical well-being. Jesus says, no, that's not your most significant need. It's not to say that Jesus is not interested in all of our conditions. Jesus is, of course, interested in all of our conditions. He's interested in all of our concerns. But what Jesus says here to his parents, here in Luke, he's saying he didn't come for that. He came to grant forgiveness. Healing was not, healing of the body was not his primary concern, it was healing of the spirit. This, my friends, is the amazing love of God that we're to see at Christmas in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came from the heaven of heavens to save one such as this paralyzed man, to save you, to save me from our sin. Your sins are forgiven you, he said to this man. And what we see is the whole of humanity, you see, he stood with, with Adam on that day. The whole of humanity came from Adam. So when he fell, so did all of we who stood with him because we were in him. All of Adam's race, me and you, all who came before us, all who will follow us. We may want to reject this truth, my friends. We may want to deny it because it offends us and say, it's not fair, I didn't do it, he did. But that does not stop the truth from being the truth. Like David, when he acknowledges this truth in, in, in Psalm 51, when he says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me, against you. And you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. And then he goes on to say, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. What is this wisdom, my friends? It is, the, the, is what Christmas is all about. It's about knowing Jesus. That's wisdom. It's about not trying to live this life morally. It's about not trying to live by our own means and our own understanding. It's about not trying to live by good deeds. 
believing that God will reward us according to the best of our actions. No, no, my friends. Remembering that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners should be our primary concern. Charles Spurgeon said on this, we're not saved by service, we're saved to service. What he means is once we are saved, from then on we live in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we refuse to be his servants, we are simply not saved. We still evidently remain servants of self, servants of Satan, servants of sin. But if we live according to Him, then we are servants of holiness and servants of salvation. We're the ones who have been delivered from the power of self-will. We're the ones who have been delivered from the domination of evil lusts. We are the ones who have been delivered from the tyranny of Satan. This is what salvation is all about. This is what the 12-year-old Jesus was speaking about. And those who are saved rejoice that we can serve Him, showing forth the evidence of a changed heart, showing forth the evidence of a renewed mind. Is that us, my friends, today? That was the Apostle Paul when he was writing to Timothy, wasn't it? 1 Timothy 1. He was ever thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ has enabled him. Christ counted him faithful. Me, says Paul. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, I was an insolent man, a rude man, disrespect, disrespectful man, I was an ignorant man, I was an unbelieving man, but yet he said, I obtained mercy, an exceedingly abundant grace, faith and love in Jesus Christ. And Paul in his love and gratitude to God in Jesus Christ never forgot who he was before Jesus halted him on that road to Damascus. Is there any wonder that he's so caught up with the wonder of God's grace and mercy? That, my friends, is the beauty of God's glorious gospel. That's the beauty and the truth about Christmas. Did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? Christmas, my friends, is about salvation. Christmas, my friends, is about dead hearts being made alive. Christmas is about blind eyes being opened. Christians, Christmas is about deaf ears being made to hear. Jesus came. Christmas means Jesus came for you and for me. And even in this very hour, if you have not yet repented and believed on Him, the opportunity is there for you. Whoever we are this morning, whatever camp we may place ourselves into, let us hear the promise of salvation Jesus brings. It's not a new message. It's the same old message. It was spoken of at the beginning of time in Genesis, and it's the same message spoken today. And it's the same message, my friends, that will continue until the end of time, until Jesus himself returns. And whether we're hearing it for the first time this morning, or for the hundredth time, my prayer is that God the Father in his mercy, by the working of the Holy Spirit, will bring to our hearts this day to repent and believe the gospel. To come to Jesus in faith and repentance. To turn to him who says in John 6, not, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And verse 40 goes on to say, and this is the will. He who came to do his father's business says, this is the will of he who sent me. This is the will of the father, that everyone who sees me, everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise them up. Because that's not all. I will raise them up on the last day. My friends, God still loves the world. Even though the world has turned their back on God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are trying. God has determined in eternity past that even though the world would turn its back on Him, he had determined that he would not turn his back on the world. Instead of leaving the world to itself, or instead of just closing the whole thing down, no, no, God decided to send someone into the world to save those in the world. That's the beauty of understanding the true meaning of Christmas. That's the beauty of understanding when Jesus says, Did you not know I must be about my Father's? 
Christmas to many, you will hear the song, I've heard it already in the supermarkets, is the most wonderful time of the year. And in fact, they're right. But not because of the sleigh bells and all the other things mentioned in that song. No, because Jesus came to be about his Father's business. And he brings him with himself the greatest gift ever given. And I say to you, as I say to my own heart, knowing this, my friends, what do we say this morning to our greatest need? Jesus stands, arms open, salvation's gift held out. And will we accept it? There's no guarantee of tomorrow. We don't know what a new day may bring forth. And now's the acceptable time. And what we are being asked. Will we accept this gift of indescribable love? I must be about my father's business.